Hello, I'm Anastasia Amoroso, and this is Beyond 6040. On this show, we do a deep dive into the alternative investment space, share industry leader insights, and discuss the latest innovations in technology. Today, we'll start with my Market Pulse snapshot, and I'll share the one thing that caught my attention this week in private markets. Next, John Dean of AXA IM Alts joins me in the studio to discuss impact investing. And then we'll answer your question of the month with iCapital's head of private market research, Kunal Shah. Let's get to it. In today's Market Pulse snapshot, the one thing I'm focused on is whether after years of excitement, the ESG investing trend is starting to wane. Should investors still allocate to these strategies or should they look elsewhere? Well, first, let's draw the distinction between all the various terms out there, ESG, sustainability, impact investing. ESG strategies are typically public market strategies that incorporate the environmental, social, and governance considerations into their investment decision-making process. Now, they may invest in clean energy or electric vehicle companies, but not only so. They also focus more broadly on companies that score highly on their ESG practices. Now, for example, this might include a tech firm that is buying renewable energy credits or another one that is building their data centers in Iceland to reduce the amount of cooling that is otherwise needed for the heat generation of servers. Now, in contrast, sustainability or impact investing specifically focuses on companies that help move the needle on certain issues by providing technologies like decarbonization, circular economy, certain access to healthcare, and more. This type of investment is mostly done in private markets. For example, there's six times as many private renewable energy companies globally versus public, or 55 times as many private companies working on carbon capture technology versus public. Now, what's interesting today is the shifting investor preference between the two types of strategies. ESG fund flows have notably weakened after the surge that we've seen in 2021. They've slowed down to a trickle by the end of last year. That could be due to recent underperformance. In 2023, the median ESG fund, proxied by 129 US ESG ETFs within the Bloomberg universe, had a total return of just 16% versus 26% for the S&P 500. However, inflows into the private sustainable investing funds have actually continued. For example, ag tech, clean tech, climate tech, and broadly in impact investing funds have collectively raised a record $100 billion in 2023, which is up 45% from 2022 levels and 70% higher than the prior five-year annual average. And these fund verticals have delivered strong returns since inception through today. Median IRRs for 2010 through 2019 vintages range from 12% to 21%. Now, I think this divergence is telling, and I think it's set to continue. One thing to note, the overlap between ESG fund holdings and non-ESG fund holdings is seemingly increasing. The top five assets held by ESG ETFs include Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet, Nvidia, and for Solar, with four of those also being the top holdings in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Now, in my opinion, more and more managers will integrate ESG considerations into the portfolio decision-making process but does that necessarily need to be done in distinct ESG funds? Maybe not. On the flip side, private markets are incubating the next generation of technology that can help tackle sustainability issues. Now, many of these companies are experiencing faster revenue and earnings growth than what's available in broad public markets, and this is what should drive the potential for above market returns. As long as these private market managers deliver both purpose and profits for investors, we think that the private market sustainable investments are attractive and should continue to grow. And that's your one thing in private markets this week. My first guest today is John Dean, head of impact investing at AXA Investment Managers Alts. AXA IM Alt has an AUM of 185 billion euros and is a global leader in the alternative space. As the head of AXA IM Alt's private market impact strategies with one and a half billion of assets under management, John oversees specifically the global health strategy. Uh, John, thanks so much for coming here today. It's great to see you. Thank you for having me. You've been in the impact investing space for 12 years. How did that come about and how has that evolved? 
Sure, so my first entry to, to the impact investing market came about uh, over 10 years ago when the space was really in its nascent phase. So there wasn't a huge amount of defined activity in impact investing. Through that 10 years, we've really been investing and creating outcomes at scale that we're now able to offer to a wider audience. So the market has grown hugely in that 10 years. Yeah, well, there's certainly a lot of debates going on across the, the impact space. And I think there's a lot of debates going on about the definition of the impact space. So how do you define impact and how do you sort of disentangle it from ESG and sustainable investing and a variety of other terms that sure. are out there? So think about it as a spectrum. So for us, ESG is uh, a risk management tool. So we have to understand it. We have to uh, appreciate that during our underwriting process for our portfolio companies. But ESG is something that is applied much, much more broadly across the whole asset management sure. industry today. Impact is actually going one step further. Okay. And it starts with this concept of trying to solve problems. And mm. then to solve a problem, you first need to quantify you know, how big is that problem and how material is our solution at solving that problem. So key words would be measurability uh, and intentionality. Uh, and the overarching key component to anything that we do in impact is that we must also deliver a market rate financial return. And you know, it's interesting, John, you mentioned solving big problems. When I think about impact and when I think about you know, what is sustainability, you know, to me it is how can we be the most efficient with the use of our finite natural resources? How can we be minimizing damage to the environment? And at the same time, how can we deliver for everybody's basic needs? And you know, if we were to look at the variety of industry statistics, you know that we're not nearly close to hitting on any of those markers. And there's far too many people in the world that don't have the proper access to food, clean water and clean energy. So what is the problem as you see it in healthcare that you're trying to tackle? COVID-19, it's reset expectations around healthcare. It's exposed inequalities within our own domestic healthcare systems, but also globally in terms of access and affordable access to healthcare outcomes. And so for us, when we think about healthcare and impact, it's really about creating scalable solutions, products that are accessible to the many, not to the few. And that is a very different perspective from traditional private equity approaches to healthcare, mm. which are focused more on high income markets, high margin products, and are not defined by scale of access. So not every investment in healthcare is an impact investment. You really have to go one step further to quantify what problem you're trying to solve, set targets around measuring the success of the solution in solving the problem, and really underwriting all of that is scale. How many people can our solutions benefit? Yeah, so let's talk specifically about some of the pain points and the issues that you are trying to tackle in healthcare. So we're really focused across the whole range of traditional interventions in healthcare, medical devices, biopharmaceuticals, vaccines and diagnostics. Mm -hmm. In terms of indications that we focus on, women's health, child and maternal health, vision, infectious disease and chronic disease. In terms of scale, we think about how do we make these products available in as many markets as possible? Mm -hmm. How do they cross borders? And to do that, the products have to have very specific characteristics. So firstly, they need to have a low cost of goods so that we know that the price point will be affordable. Because if we create a product that's too expensive, it will be an immediate bottleneck to access. A similar bottleneck could be also the uh, caregiver, uh, the product's ease of use. So if we rely on the top surgeon in New York as the only person that can administer the intervention, we've created another bottleneck sure. in terms of access. So we focus on products that can be used by lower skilled healthcare workers or ultimately consumers ourselves to again, maximize access. And these products must be durable. You know, they need to cross borders, global health. They need to be able to be penetrating into middle and low income countries mm -hmm. and into those marketplaces. They can't rely on complex cold chains. They need to be shelf stable all at the same time as having a clinical competitive advantage. So oftentimes you invest in companies, healthcare companies that might be based here in the United States, they might be based in the UK, they might be based in the European Union, but the products that those companies pursue are actually distributed on a global basis. Give us an example or two maybe of a company like that that you've invested in that is solving a global challenge. Sure, so uh, a recent example would be an intervention around postpartum hemorrhage or excessive bleeding in childbirth, which affects around 11% of deliveries globally. Uh, and we invested in a medical device which essentially can address the problem in far superior time frame to a much higher efficacy than the solutions that existed previously. It can do all of this with a product which can be manufactured at a very affordable cost of goods. It's very easy to use and therefore it has those characteristics which facilitate scale and expansion. 
So that product starts its life in the US, but yeah. absolutely has a very clear pathway to address those problems globally in middle and low income countries as well because of the design of the product. But equally, the, the fascinating thing about that, that concept is that not only is the product have global potential in terms of its use case, the product also performs better in its home and domestic markets. It's lower cost of goods, it's easier to use, it's more durable. Those features make it penetrate and commercialize far better in its home market, as well as having the potential to be global. So there really isn't a trade-off there in terms of value creation. In fact, it works in harmony, and that's why these kinds of products do have a lot of interest uh, and even a premium interest from potential acquirers who are buying that package and know that their product will be able to penetrate markets sure. in a far superior manner. So it's interesting that you say, you know, in order to enable access, you have to make sure that there's a low cost of goods. And, you know, that to me also would imply a low price point. If you have a product that's perhaps is a lot cheaper than something else that's available in the market, how do you get to that market return for your investors? So scale, so firstly, our products need to reach global populations. So our impact is measured on, on the volume of outcomes and, and that can also translate into revenues in terms of how many products can be sold. Secondly, just because it's got a low, pro a low cost of goods doesn't mean that the price point can't be attractive for a potential acquirer. The fact is that actually we've been so rigorous on the cost of goods during our due diligence that actually that margin can be protected. And again, the kinds of people that are buying these companies from our portfolio in the exit phase, they're recognizing that the products have been calibrated for scale. And just one other question on performance. You know, I recently saw this interesting chart that showed that the signatories to PRI, the principles of responsible investing, those GPs uh, have delivered returns, but they're not materially different friend and or maybe were slightly less than you know other GPs that did not actually sign up to those principles. So why do you think that there is this kind of lack of outperformance of impact strategies? And is that, you know, is that index in particular PRI, is that even representative? So I'd say that's more relevant on defining the scope of responsible investment. Impact investing is actually going further down that spectrum. So absolutely, when we underwrite, we're underwriting to the same market rate return that any other private equity healthcare strategy would. There's no concession there. You know, delivering those target returns, those target financial returns that our LPs expect is critical. That's why we have an institutional investor base and that's why we are looking to also broaden that to a private wealth distribution also because it does deliver and behave like traditional private equity asset classes would. Sure, and I'm very glad you brought that up, that you know, you're, as you look to uh, investors who might be interested in participating in strategies like this, it's not only the institutional investor, but also the private wealth channel. And so you know, why do you think this strategy might be particularly well suited for the private wealth channel? Yeah, we're very excited to be able to offer this strategy to a broader audience because impact is relevant for, for a very, very large stakeholder base. Yes, the institutions have provided capital here, but private wealth, is absolutely a, a key place where we expect to see a lot of interest in, in what we're doing. And that's because it's an emotive topic, healthcare. Healthcare mm. touches everybody's lives. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately from the private wealth channels, there is a connection to be able to use resources to be able to try and solve some of these large global problems. So it, it makes sense from a moral perspective to think about healthcare as an important place to invest capital. If we can then deliver the market rate financial performance on top, there really is a win-win model for sure. investors. And that's a really important channel that we expect private wealth to adopt. And historically, it has been uh, a space where you know, private equity strategies have been harder to reach those end users. Today, we have means to be able to do that through private wealth platforms. John, this is fantastic. And you know, I recently participated in the sustainable finance uh, panel in Lisbon. And one of the questions that uh, we were asked on the panel is, what does it take for impact to be successful? And my answer was, was we need to deliver not only the purpose, but also the profits. Because if that happens, that's what drives investor interest, investor engagement, and funding. They can, in turn, flow to companies that are solving real world problems. So uh, it's been fantastic to hear about how your global healthcare strategy is doing exactly that. Uh, and I thank you so much for uh, stopping by and sharing your insights today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, John. Today, I'm very pleased to say we're launching our new interactive segment, Your Question of the Month, where we answer your most pressing questions about the world of alternatives and private markets. And our first question comes from James, who asks, 
where are we in the public to private market pricing resets? There's obviously a lot to unpack there, and so I've asked our iCapital head of private market research, Kunal Shah, to help us answer that question. Kunal, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Well, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of different facets to this question, mm -hmm. and I think what really is underlying that is a lot of people can look at private a public market valuations mm -hmm. and the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, and it's not as easy to look at the valuation multiples when it comes to private equity. Yep. So let's dig into that. Where are we in the private equity valuation resets? Yeah, so just like the question you asked, it's, a, it's a answer is pretty complicated and long, right? So let's start with the fundamental piece, which is private equity valuations are often lagging public market valuation in terms of catching up, right? The transactions don't happen right away, it takes a while, and the valuation and negotiation process is oftentimes longer in private markets. So we almost I always expect six months to 12 months of lag between public market valuation and private market valuation. Before I go into the current environment, let me mm -hmm. just say one thing, which is long-term averages, which mm -hmm. is the best way to evaluate any asset class, shows that private equity valuations, which includes private equity, which is mostly buyout and some growth equity, yeah. has always been lower or ha has been lower eight out of the last 10 years compared to public market valuation for that specific year. And for public markets, I'm using S&P 500, right. and private markets, you are using a private equity index. Where are we today then? So the question, co coming back to the question that you're asking, today, the private equity valuations are still below public market valuation okay. by a factor of about 20%. Okay. However, coming into 2023, we were expecting the valuation to correct. They did, in mm -hmm. the first half of the year, private equity valuations were just short of 10, 10 times EBITDA multiple. Okay. Second down half, from down where? from closer to 13 times the year prior to that. Okay. So it was a pretty significant drop, about 20% correction there as well. Yeah. Second half of 23, we started seeing some optimism seep in, largely driven by the public market performance. I mean, mm -hmm. NASDAQ was, I think, up 40%. You probably will know better than I do. So there was a significant uh, in improvement in public market valuations and sentiments that seeped into private equity valuation. And second half of the 2023 private equity valuations were closer to 12 times to give you the average for year, the year of 2023, somewhere in the range of 11 times money multiple. Right. Still, I'm sorry, so 11 times EBITDA multiple. Still below where it was in 21, but significantly higher than what we were expecting coming into the year and especially higher than what it was in the first half of 2023. Right, so we've definitely seen a drawdown in valuations, but we've seen a stabilization and even a bounce back. And yep. I guess that makes sense considering the public market valuations, mm -hmm. which were, you know, start the year maybe 14, 15 times, but to finish the year, they were approaching 20. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense that private market sort of uh, had to catch up with that. I guess let's talk about the investment implications of yep. that. Um, you know, on the, uh, on, the, on the one hand, you say, well, since valuations have already bounced mm -hmm. back, you know, maybe that's not as good for forward returns. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if valuations are higher, maybe more GPs actually want to exit yep. some of the deals that they haven't been able to exit before. So what's the investment takeaway? Yeah, so there are a couple of things there, right? So let's start with uh, the piece around sort of valuation, adjusting upwards, what does that mean for exit, right? More, more fund managers are willing to sell. Selling oftentimes is an early indication of fundraising. What happens is investors receive money back and they're now willing to invest that money again with the same manager or some other managers because they have now capital and fresh cash to redeploy with private equity fund managers. So I think that's a potentially a trend to look forward to in 2024. The, the other piece as valuations reset is deal making activity will pick up. And so all of a sudden you have a much larger sample set to look at from a valuation perspective mm -hmm. that are these companies collectively getting done at the same valuation or were we looking at the data which was a little bit skewed by the quality of companies? In other words, in 2023, I believe the best companies were transacting because you know people were focusing on quality over everything else. Sure. And so was the data skewed because you were going after better quality companies on average? And 2024, as more data gets captured because more companies are being transacted, it might tell you a slightly different story around what the valuation really means across the industry. Um, I guess the other piece to factor in is it's still at a discount to public markets, right? And so when you think about the public market valuation as a result of that, you know, I think there's an arbitrage to be captured. You can buy low in private markets and sell high in public markets. 
That's right. And either way, it is a helpful development for investors that there's been some valuation correction. But as you point out, I know in a lot of articles that you write, it's not just the multiples, it's mm -hmm. not just the low cost of leverage, but it's the value creation that yes. some of our asset management partners are able to generate for investors. That's what drives the long-term value creation in private equity. 100%. Thank you, Kunal. That was great perspective on a very important question on public to private market valuation resets. And James, thank you so much for your question as well. We'd like to hear more from you, so please send an email to us at yourquestion at icapitalnetwork.com and let us know the questions that are top of mind for you and your clients. I'm Anastasia Amoroso, and thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time on Beyond 6040.